Aren't you thankful for that reckless love of God? Wow. Man, he reaches down to the broken and the hurting. He never leaves. He never forsakes. He is always present. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that love. A love that we don't earn, a love that we don't deserve, but that you give so freely. A continual invitation to who you are. Father, help us. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 1. Yes, ma'am. Oh, children, you're dismissed. Children, adults, stay seated. John chapter 1, and then we're going to shift over to uh, John chapter 14. And these are very familiar words to most people. I want to share this little story with you. God was sitting in heaven one day when a scientist said to him, Lord, we don't need you anymore. Science has finally figured out a way to create life out of nothing. In other words, we can now do what you did in the beginning. Oh, is that so? Tell me, replied God. Well, said the scientist, we can take dirt and form it into the likeness of you and breathe life into it, thus creating man. Well, that's interesting. Show me. So the scientist bit down to the earth and started to mold the soil. Oh, no, 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 interrupted God. Get your own dirt. <laughs> John chapter 1. Starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that had been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Whoo! Does that get anybody excited? I'm sorry. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And Though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word. We don't think a lot about that. But this word that we translate word is the word logos. Logos is a very, very uh, unique word. If you go back and you uh, study the language it was written in, in Greek, that word logos has a lot more meanings than just a word. Have you ever wondered why you're here? I mean, not in church on Sunday. But why you exist, why you're here, um, a lot of people struggle with that. A lot of people really struggle with meaning. Why am I here? As a chaplain in hospice, a lot of people will say, and they'll express to me, I don't know why I'm still here. I don't know why God has not taken me yet. And I think one of the greatest problems with humanity, and I know one of the greatest problems I struggle with myself, is that I try to define meaning 
by me. That word logos is the word that we use to get logic, reason, and meaning. See, for us as human beings, one of the most important things I can tell you, if you don't take anything else away from this morning, you are not the meaning. You're not the meaning. Imagine if that was your burden to define. But a lot of people live their lives trying to be the meaning in themselves. And we live in a world where people have done that. Meaning is what I define it. Boy, what a frightening place to be. But I love how John starts his gospel. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the meaning. In the beginning was the logic. In the beginning was the reason. And that reason was not you. Hallelujah. It was God. It's God. God in the beginning. God is the reason. God is the meaning. In the beginning, God had a plan. God, who created the heavens and the earth, who flung the stars into the sky. We look at the gospel of John and we see it all starts and it ends with him. You know, it's funny. Science uh, keeps discovering more and more and more. And uh, we think we're so far along in the journey. Um, have you ever noticed that? You know, I told the story about uh, the scientists coming and saying, Oh, God, we don't need you. We can do this. And God says, Get your own dirt. For us as human beings, we were not created to be an end in ourselves. We were not created to just live for ourselves. But we live in a world where that seems to be the way everybody lives, isn't it? And we wonder why the world is in the mess that it's in, don't we? I know we've been going through Jeremiah and we've been looking in, in, in discipleship class or Bible study class. And we see this story of what appears as God's judgment. And it is God's judgment, but it's a perfect judgment. That God was trying to bring the people to himself. To stop looking elsewhere for meaning. To stop looking elsewhere for something that you can use to control your world. You weren't created to control your world. You were created for God. You were created for Him. And our problem is, is that we as human beings think somehow, some way, we try to manipulate or control God. I, I remember I, I used to believe many years ago that if I just memorized enough scripture, if I just focused on the word, if I just studied hard enough, I could be good. Anybody else ever done that? And you know what I discovered? The more I studied, the more I learned, the more I realized I'm not good. Jesus said, no one is good save your Father in heaven. If Jesus said that, what does that say about us? But I want you to discover. I want you to discover The God that created you. What his motivation is. And who he is. Because it is then. It is then that we can truly live. 
Because the life is not in us. It's in who? Him. The light is not in us. It is in Him. John 14, 6 says this. Thomas, he's, he's worried. He's concerned. He said, how do we know the way? And Jesus looks at him and he says these words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I remember growing up. Did anybody ever pray this when they were younger? God, what do you want me to become? God, just show me the path. Just help me to become what you want me to become. And, and we, we spent a lot of time. I, we live back years ago. We used to have an idea of what we thought we were supposed to be. Do you ever think that? That five years down the road. Anybody ever have a five-year plan? My wife's here. My, we used to, we had a, when we first got married, we had a five-year plan. And that five-year plan did not include kids. Guess what? I think we made it two years before the first one showed up. And what I realized, if I'm going to be where God wants me to be, that happens when? Every day, every moment, every second. If you want to be where God wants you to be, focus on the present. This moment, today. And realize that the way isn't a road. It's not 565 on your way to Huntsville. It's not I-65 on your way to Nashville or Birmingham. The way is a person. We live in a world where truth has become very subjective, hasn't it? Truth is what you define. Man, what a burden we're putting on people. What a burden we're putting on our kids. Realize that if you've got to define truth, you're in trouble. I mean, honestly. I, I, I think about even trying to define good. How do we define good? As human beings, we define good if it benefits me. If it benefits me, it's good, right? Right? Well, what happens when your good conflicts with somebody else's good? It gets bad. Well, how could good get bad? What happens when your truth conflicts with somebody else's truth? Kind of means that there's no truth. And if you study philosophy, and if you study the current world in which we live, guess what? People will say, there is no truth. Truth is not an idea. Truth is a person. And if we're trying to define good for ourselves, and if we're trying to define a way for ourselves, and we're trying to define everything by ourselves, what do we end up with? Not much life, is it? Because in our marriages, what happens? I'm defining life by the way I want to define it. Well, guess what? If your wife's doing the same thing, guys, what's going to happen? Huh? Conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. To put it mildly, yes. Divorce. Divorce. Life is a person. 
But I want you to capture who the way, the truth, and the life is. The way, the truth, and the life loves you. He loves you. He loves you in a way that you can't even begin to imagine sometimes. Because we come to church and we put on our best attitude and our best, well, we don't worry about the clothes anymore, but we worry about, we're going to bring the best. I'm going to show up in church and I'm going to walk through the door and I'm going to have a spot. Have you noticed that nobody coming to church ever has a hard time? How are you doing? I'm great. Why do we go to church? Guess what? If you're good, you don't need church. Right? If you're great, you don't need church. That means that for this moment, in this second, you get everything lined up the way you think it's supposed to be. And how long does it take for that little boat that you've built to sink? As soon as you walk out the door, thank you, Courtney. Yeah. But this God... This meaning, this reason, this logic, this way, this truth, this life is a person. You know what he did? He left heaven. He left heaven. And he came. And he was born into a manger. In some backwoods place in Palestine that nobody would ever think about, that nobody would ever consider as being of value whatsoever. In the one place in the Roman Empire where nobody wanted to be. He was born to a young girl, betrothed to a man, where everybody talked about, well, you know, she says she was a virgin. Mmm. You don't think Jesus heard those rumors? He did. Can you imagine growing up in that kind of world? Where the money you paid were for foreign occupiers. The work you did, somebody else took the profit and placed soldiers where you could see. A people that were conquered and defeated and destroyed. And yet God shows up in that place. In that place. In that time. Does anybody think the world's dark now? Boy, it was a lot darker then. A whole lot darker then. And you look in the world now and what do you see? Darkness. Now I want you to understand something. Scripture says that God created everything. And he did. But what is darkness? The absence of... It's just like cold. What is cold? The absence of heat. What is evil? The absence of God. Wow. In a world, it seemed like God had forgotten them. In a place... That everybody had written off. This God. Comes. As a baby. Born in a manger. And grows up in a culture. That seems devoid of light. And he comes. To the very people he created. The very people that he designed. 
And what do they do? They reject him. I don't want your light. I don't want your truth. I don't want your way. It sounds like teenagers, doesn't it? Hmm. And what do they do? They crucify him. Why do we do that? As human beings, there is that part of us that we want to be God. It's that sinful nature that exists within all of us, doesn't it? We want to dictate to God how he should do things. Anybody ever done that? I believe, I believe with all my heart, the whole world wants to serve God, but they want to serve God in an advisory capacity. Tell him how to do it. And most of our prayers are, God, would you fix this? But this is how you need to do it. Do it my way. Ooh. Use my light. Use my truth. And when we do that, are we not doing the same thing that they did in the first century? Aren't we rejecting? Because a lot of people go through life and they think God's mad at them because they're going through a hard time. Understand, it is those hard times that God does work that he cannot do anywhere else. Because it is in those dark times and those hard times that his light shines in and transforms us from the inside out. God is not afraid to invade your darkness. God is not afraid to destroy your truth. God is not afraid to mess up your life. Not because he's mean. But because he loves. He loves you and there is nothing 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 he wouldn't do i remember last sunday sermon do y'all remember the last sunday sermon where steve talked about jesus coming through locked doors jesus coming through locked doors locked doors and why were those doors locked What was it? Fear. Say that again loud. Fear. Fear. And you know what? As human beings, as we approach God and we keep doors locked, you know why we keep them, keep them locked? We're afraid. I wonder how many times in my life have I tried to keep God out of my rooms. Now, if, if you were married to me, like my wife is, there are certain rooms I keep locked. My closet. You know why? Chris, you can say. <laughs> you know what? You know what? My closet is a mess. It's the only place I have in the house. It's my mess. You know what? I bet every single person in this room has closets, doors, rooms that are a mess. But on Sundays, we want to come out and show God, oh, God, look, I'm here in the church and it looks so good, so good. It looks so nice. My life, my way, my truth, it's good. And God says, what about this closet? Can I come in? And what do we say? 
No, 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 don't, don't, don't go in there. Don't mess with that. But you know what? He loves you. And he'll find a way to get in behind your locked doors. Because he's mean? No. Because he loves. Because you know what? It's the messy closets. The messy rooms. That remind us that we don't earn love. We don't deserve love. But that's what we get. And you know what? When we invite him in. When we show him. You can see all of this. And he sees anyway. He does, doesn't he? He already knows what's there. But he wants to heal you. Because it is love that brings healing. When you're ready to surrender your way, when you're ready to sender, surrender your truth, when you're ready to surrender your life, what does he bring? Love. Where there is love, there is freedom. 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 There was a man, this is back in the 1920s, his car had broken down on the side of the road. People just kept passing him, passing him. He'd try and wave them down and they just kept going. And finally a guy pulls up behind him and he gets out, walks around to him and says, uh, Hey, let me, see, uh, let me see if I can help. The guy says, man, I've tried everything. I don't know what to do. I, I, <laughs> I, this is an old Model T. I don't know what to do. And the guy says, let me see what I can do. So he comes over and he lifts up the hood on the side of the car. And he starts to tinker around underneath the hood. And as he tinkers around underneath the hood, he says, go ahead and see if it'll start. And sure enough. That old Model T starts to run. And the guy says, oh, thank God, thank God, thank God. I'm so glad you're here. Let me give you some money. The guy says, no, don't worry about it. He said, no, no, let me give you something. Uh, You stopped when I was in need. I I really need, I needed help. I was never going to get where I needed to go. He says, no, don't worry about it. He said, please, please. At least give me your name. Give me your name. That way I can reach out to you later on. The man said, my name is Henry Ford. I designed your car. I know what makes it run. Guess what, folks? If your life's not running, if it's not operating the way it was meant to operate remember what Jesus said Jesus said I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly the previous verses says that the thief comes to steal kill and destroy guess what if your life's not running the way it's supposed to run go to the word Go to the logos. Go to the meaning. Go to that person who's the way to give your life meaning. Go to that person that is the truth that says you don't have to be the truth 
He's saying, let me be the truth. Go to that person who is the life. Go to him. And if there's parts of your life that's a mess, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He's not here to beat you up. He's here to help you. To help you to live. He is a person that loves you so much that he gave his very life for you. You can trust him. Let's pray. Father, help us. And Father, I want to lift up those right now who are looking at their life and they've closed parts of it off from you. Saying, don't go there, don't go there. And Father, I pray they would surrender their way that they would surrender their truth they would surrender their life to a God who loves and has healing and hope and promise that as they go on this journey they will open those closets that they will open that mess that they will surrender that hurt they will give their heart to you Father have your will your way your meaning your truth, your life in us. We pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Are you glad you came to church? You can shout hallelujah. Steve will be back next week. May God bless you. May He keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you in your coming and your going. And know that as you walk out that door, you can carry the way, the truth, and the life with you.